Today I want to talk about a single vitamin that could both transform your bone health and protect your heart health. That's why we look at bone health through the lens of HealthSpan. So I want to talk about vitamin K, the different forms, the research, where we are in our recommendations, because this has changed over time. And I'm also going to talk about some products that we're recommending to our patients now. So stay tuned to the end. All right. So vitamin K is a really confusing vitamin for a lot of people because before I would say probably the, the you know, the last 10 years, most people have thought about vitamin K through the lens of don't take too much vitamin K because it's going to cause a blood clot, right? That's what I was taught. We were taught to fear vitamin K because it had the potential to play a part in the, the blood clotting pathway and that you shouldn't take too much or you shouldn't take any at all because you're going to have a blood clot. So I definitely want to dig into the, the that fear because I'll just say it right here, that fear is not real for the vast majority of people. We'll talk about the details of that. So I also want to talk about the research around the different types of vitamin K. And this is also a confusing area. This is one of those vitamins. It's a fat soluble vitamin. And so where you get it from really matters and the form really matters. And so you can get vitamin K in plant forms and you can get vitamin K in animal forms. So the plant forms are called phyloquinones. The animal forms are called menaquinones. They're just different vitamins. You can convert one to the other, but how much you convert and how readily you do that is going to be genetically driven. It's not easy to test or able to test that I'm aware of, and it's going to change how much you can get of K2 when you're consuming mostly K1. So it's going to be one of those areas where we are going to dig a little bit into animal versus plant sources. All right, so let's talk about where we find vitamin K naturally before we start talking about supplementation. So K1, most people are going to say, comes from leafy greens. This is actually the form of vitamin K that is involved in the blood clotting pathway, but don't worry, eating leafy greens has not been associated with an increased risk of blood clot. So you're okay there. And then vitamin K2 or metaquinone is found in fermented foods, other animal products, some dairy, and apparently plays a really crucial role in bone and heart health. Now you can't get that much through a, what would be considered a normal diet. So there is some conversion of K1 to K2, but again, it's gonna vary from person to person. The overall consumption of vitamin K seems to be low in our population with our food. And so as a result of that, we generally are gonna look at supplementing vitamin K, particularly K2 in just about all of our patients. So when it comes to bone health, there's some different schools of thought here. And the way that I like to look at this is that we wanna use the best form of a vitamin that has the best research that we can take in a reasonable manner through a reasonable form that's gonna have the impact that we want. So when you look at vitamin K2, there's two main forms. There's actually several, but the two main forms that we talk about in the, the research and with our patients is MK4 and MK7. Now, these are just subclassifications, slightly different of vitamin K2 molecules. The reason why I prefer and discuss with my patients mostly is MK7 is because it has a higher half-life or a longer half-life, meaning that it's going to take longer for it to get metabolized by the body. As a result of that, you can take less of it and less frequently. So we're going to talk about taking less, a smaller dose and not as often throughout the day. So we're usually dosing this once a day, twice a day, maybe. But for the most part, people are going to get away with dosing this once a day. Whereas if you were to use MK4, you would need more and you need to dose it more frequently. So there's a challenge with pill burden there. The dosing around MK7 in the literature seems to be somewhere between kind of 100 to 200 micrograms per day. The reason why they've used this dosing is that it has an impact directly on the hormone osteocalcin. So osteocalcin carboxylation is what vitamin K2 does, and it's critical for bone health. There's a 2015 meta-analysis that I pulled that had 19 randomized control trials and over 6,000 women that showed significant improvements in vertebral BMD with vitamin K2 supplementation. Now, not all studies show a lot of improvement. In fact, I have an example of one that doesn't. But we have to understand that when we're dealing with a vitamin, we're probably not going to see massive changes if that's the only intervention. Meaning that if you don't change anything else about somebody who doesn't have optimized hormones, who isn't eating an optimal diet, and they're not doing any resistance training or impact, you give them vitamin K2, are they going to see a massive increase in their bone mineral density? Probably not. So the fact that we see any signal as a single intervention or associations and population studies, I think is actually relatively impressive. And it's a reason to consider using these vitamins, especially if we know we're, we are uh, inadequately getting them through diet. 
I do want to talk about the second study, though. This is a 2013 randomized control trial that showed 180 micrograms per day of vitamin K2 as MK7 over three years adequately improved vitamin K status, which is actually not easy to measure, but they were measuring vitamin K status, and it decreased age-related age bone loss, but it actually didn't build bone. Again, it just slowed bone and this is compared to a placebo. So again, you see some of these relatively good sized studies that are showing that it's doing something, but it's not gonna give the same impact as if you were to put it all together in a big program or even potentially take a pharmaceutical. So before I get to the other two forms of vitamin K that I wanna talk about, let me just take a quick moment to talk about our masterclass. If you haven't been to our masterclass and you're struggling to put together your own bone health program, please consider the free masterclass. Link is in the description on YouTube or on our website, optimalhumanhealth.com. If you have been to the masterclass and you feel like you need more support, consider our Health Span Nation. It's our community with weekly topic-driven Q&As uh, with myself or with a team member. It's a really great community of individuals who are improving their bone health, they're asking the right questions, they're doing all the right things, they're using each other for accountability. It's awesome. So I would encourage you to be a part of HSN if you've already gone through the masterclass and you haven't quite figured out what's right for you. So when it comes to dosages, I think we're still kind of in a gray area here with the research. Now, I already mentioned that sort of 100 to 200 micrograms for K2 is MK7. And that's what the recommendations are across the board. That's what the research has been using. So I think we're safe in that department. I've not seen any comparative studies though using you know double that dose, triple that dose, but I don't think we necessarily need more. I don't think more would necessarily be better. If you look at say the National Academy of Medicine, they're gonna recommend from a vitamin K1 perspective around 120 micrograms per day and around 90 micrograms per day for women. Now my guess is that's probably kind of low. MK4, we're talking about 600 to 1500 micrograms per day. So like I mentioned before, bigger dose, shorter half-life. It also apparently doesn't absorb very well. So we still use it because sometimes we wanna just hit as many avenues as possible, especially if there doesn't seem to be a downside. The question is, what's the right dose that's going to have an impact on osteocalcin that's gonna actually cause the carboxylation of osteocalcin to help us to calcify the bone as we're building it? And it looks like from a K1 perspective, it's around 250 to 1,000 micrograms. K2 is MK4. It's in that same dose, around 1,000 to 1,500. And MK7 is sort of between 100 and 300 micrograms. So we have good bench research to show that, but we don't have tremendous big studies in humans, uh, again, comparing different doses. So this is ballpark. All right, so that's bone health. Now, that's enough in my opinion, of a reason to take vitamin K2. I've been recommending it to my patients before I really got into the literature around cardiovascular health. But let me walk you down this pathway because as I've mentioned in other videos on supplements, it's always nice to take a supplement that hits multiple goals in your health span pathway. So the cardiovascular risk, if you have something that works from a cardiovascular risk perspective, it's always worth considering because let's face it, it is the number one killer hands down of all of us. So if we can improve our cardiovascular risk with a supplement that also helps with our bones, this is a win-win. So how beneficial is it? Well, there are some people that say that it is extraordinarily beneficial. I think the, the literature is not as convincing as I'd like it to be, but it still shows a really good signal. So I've got a 2009 study here that shows that high dietary intake of, through diet, vitamin K2, is associated with reduced coronary calcification. This is compared to people that weren't consuming as much. So more consumption of that vitamin through food was associated with reduced coronary, that's the blood vessels that give blood to your heart, coronary calcification. Now, whenever you're looking at associations, you have to always wonder like, well, what are the other factors that are responsible for that? And so remember that vitamin K2 is found in fermented foods, it's found in some dairy, it's found in animal products. So you're looking at a population of people that are eating high quantities of those foods, they're probably also gonna be doing some other things that would likely be healthy for them. So maybe there's a little bit of a healthy user bias there. But we have more. So there's another 2009 study looking at K1 supplementation. It showed that it could actually slow the progression of coronary artery calcium too, especially in those that had pre-existing coronary artery calcium. So this is a great example for you know, plant-based individuals to say, well, maybe vitamin K1 is going to convert enough to K2. But again, that's genetically driven, so I wouldn't lean on that too hard. Another study called the Rotterdam study from 2004 looked at you know, higher K2 intake, that's how they describe it, and that higher K2 intake was associated with reduced risk of 
coronary heart disease, that's heart disease, plaque formation, and, and aortic calcification. So there's you know, kind of these associations, which I think are really great. And then there's a big study that hasn't been published yet that I would love to see the results of called the Vita-K CAC trial. Um, that's going to be a cool study. They're going to look at, in a, a nice design, the development of coronary calcium over time with the use of vitamin K. So it's being done. We will learn. All right, so it's probably good for your bones. It's probably good for your heart. But what about risk? A lot of people are told by their doctors, don't take vitamin K. It's going to cause a blood clot. Well, I'm here to tell you that I've looked through the research, and there is just no research showing that any vitamin supplementation or consumption through food leads to an increased risk of blood clot. Just period, hard stop, hands down. However, if you're on the drug Coumadin or Warfarin, that's not true, okay? So hear me here. If you're on a drug, warfarin or coumadin, a blood thinner, it's kind of an antiquated blood thinner, but lots of people are still on it, consuming vitamin K1 will mess with your dosing and your blood levels, and it will impact your anticoagulation, the, the thinness of your blood. So if you're on warfarin, coumadin, I offer you two things. One is don't consume vitamin K1, or at least consume it consistently so you can dose off of it. Talk to your doctors and two, see if you can get on a different drug because there are newer, in my opinion, better drugs out there for blood thinners. So I would encourage you to pursue that so then you don't have to be as worried about vitamin K. Now, for those that are on other blood thinners, again, please talk to your doctor, but I cannot find any evidence that the newer versions of anticoagulating drugs are going to have an issue with any vitamin K supplementation. They're not vitamin K dependent. That's not how they work. So again, I don't think there's any issue here, but of course you need to talk to your own team, especially if you have blood clotting issues or at risk for a blood clot. Now, if you don't want to just believe me, then I have multiple studies here. So I've got a 2012 randomized control trial on MK7 that shows that there's no change in what's called thrombin generation. They're looking at blood clotting specifically. 2002 RCT looking at vitamin K2 and D3 on bone mineral density and showed no adverse effects of coagulation. 2001 clinical trial looking at high dose MK4 no change in thrombotic tendency in elderly patients with osteoporosis. So I don't think we need to worry about that, but it, you'll, you'll hear it. I'm, I promise you, you'll hear it from your doctors because they were trained that way. I was trained that way. It still makes me anxious. And I've read the research as, as far as I can, I can to see if there's any evidence of clotting here, and it just doesn't exist. So then how do we get this? How do we get this in? Well, again, getting it through diet is great. And I love getting nutrients through diet, but it's hard to get enough K2 through diet. And you don't know what your genetics are converting K1 to K2. So like I said before, this is one that we do recommend supplementing. There's a couple of different ways that we do this. Generally, we're going to recommend an algae product for both the mineral side, as well as the fat soluble side. It's important to get all the fat solubles together if possible, because you need them all and they can come together conveniently. So this is what we're doing right now. We use Algae Cal Plus, which is gonna get you 100 micrograms of K2 as MK7. And importantly, this is in an all trans form. There are lots of K2 as MK7 products out there. Generally, they're gonna be listed as K2 as MK7, and it's gonna be a combination of trans and cis. And no, this is not a gender conversation. This has to do with the way that the molecule is made. And a trans molecule your body can use, a cis molecule your body cannot. So the trans molecule is what you want. The proprietary blend that they have of K2 as MK7 in the AlgaCal products is all trans. So important differentiation there. Um, so 100 mics there, and then we add the AlgaCal D3 complete. That gets you another 50 mics of MK7, 4,500 of MK4, and 1,000 of K1. So you're getting all three through this combination. That's how we do vitamin K in our practice. Pretty much every patient, as we're updating their programs or they're coming into our program, these are the supplements that they're on. So if you haven't already gone down this pathway, look for the link in the description to get a discount off of your initial purchase from AlgaCal. Again, these are the products that we're using for that foundation. Both vitamin K1 and K2 are vital, but vitamin K2, especially MK7, is particularly beneficial for bone and likely beneficial for heart health. And that's all I've got for today. So remember that osteoporosis isn't the end, but deciding to reverse it is a beginning. I'll see you in the next video.